Kayo Saka qui revient avec de l'élan, de la vitesse. Martine Odegaard, frappe de Degaard Oh, c'est un tireur d'élite, Martine Odegaard Un pied gauche d'une précision diabolique. Arsenal s'envole dans ce derby. Arsenal s'envole en tête du championnat de 0 C'est fort, c'est très fort. Extra. Hello and welcome to another Arsecast Extra as always with James from Gunner Blog. James. Well, it's a goodly morning. Tottenham got battered like they always do. Arsenal, they scored two. Richarlison's a load of poo. Thank you very much for that. Uh, very that goodly morning to you. And it was delivered in such a goodly manner as well. Of the course. The tone of that voice. That's, of course. That's how it, uh, goodly morning should always be said. That is Good, the, uh, of- yeah, that's the voice for my new concept album, which is just a load of ABBA covers uh, slagging off Tottenham. It's in the works. I approve. <laughs> Let me say, I approve. Oh, it's lovely, isn't it? I know that, you know, Basking time was supposed to be a, a Christmas uh, idea, mm. and, you know, after 12 nights or whatever, you're supposed to put all the Christmas things away. But wow, fuck the Tottenham. It is very much still basking time. It is, it is. And thank you very much indeed to everybody who has inundated us this morning, not just with questions for this Arscast Extra, but with many pictures of the goodly morning mugs mm. containing the goodly morning coffees and teas and, and whatever else people have been drinking this morning. So thank you all uh, for, for sending those our way. I I'm mean, drinking from mine right now. And listen, since they were manufactured, Arsenal have remained top of the league and won the North London derby. It can't be coincidence. It definitely can't. I mean, it can't just be Mikel Arteta and his coaching staff putting together a great team, uh, training them well, upskilling them, coaching them, uh, making them tactically astute and aware, instilling in them a, a desire and a passion to win, to represent the shirt, the badge, the red and white of, of North London that we know, of course, that North London is red. It has to be something more, and it can only be the mugs. Yeah, exactly. When you think about this team, there's a kind of indescribable X factor to them. <laughs> Actually, that what that X factor is, is the mug factor. The mug uh, factor. Yeah, I, wow. What a great day it was, as Ian Wright said, another great day. He did say that, didn't he? I have a. I think I have him here somewhere. This is this is Ian Wright. A little play, a little remix from him. It's a great day. It's a great day. It's a great day. <laughs> <laughs> Can barely contain himself. Tell me this, though. Tell me this. You know, because I, like many of the people listening to this, was watching this on on television and enjoying it. But you were there mm. in a professional capacity, of course. Um, Utterly professional. I, I, you know, I did notice your Instagram post with the, the, the celebration tongue of dog. Is that how you describe that? I don't know. Is that the I dog tongue I mean, of celebration? Be, yeah, I don't know. It seemed to be this kind of de facto derby celebration uh, with the tongue. With the tongue, uh, you know, yeah, a whole lot of tongue. Um, <laughs> yes, I snuck that in. Uh, the photo, not the tongue. I, I snuck the tongue in inside my mouth. And then I took a photograph of myself sticking it out. Very good. You smuggled your tongue into White Hart Lane. I, I yeah, approve. Yeah, they did a bag search. They didn't think <laughs> to look inside the mouth. We don't want anyone bring any tongues in in case they start, you know, sticking them out in celebration. Not having oh, any sure of that. fooled them. Yeah. Um, but what was, what was it like inside the stadium, you know, from an Arsenal fan's perspective, you're not in the away end, you are in the press box. It is a little bit different in there, but you can also um, gauge the atmosphere in a kind of objective way because you've got whatever amount of 
Spurs fuckers all around you and then, you know, the pocket of Arsenal fans that are there. So, you know, in, in brief terms, can you describe to us how it felt inside the stadium? What what the, you know, the build-up to this game was huge. It's always big. Um, they have a lot of flashy lights and shit like that, which yeah. I don't know if they get people in the mood or not, but, you know, they flash their lights and I guess they were thinking, remember what we did here last May? Remember how we played? Remember... Remember how uh, convincing our win was? Let's do that again. And it became quite apparent pretty quickly that that was not going to be the case. So how did how did the stadium react, if you like? Well, as a man who was at that encounter in May, sat in the same seat in the press box, yesterday was all the more delicious. And I have to say, you know, I, from where I was sat, I had a brilliant vantage point because I was kind of opposite the away fans. So although I was not among them mm. as I as I wished and dreamed to be, I could observe them beautifully, having the absolute time of their lives. And I, I, the atmosphere was uh, white hot, as it often is before a North London derby, you know, despite all the uh, music and light shows. And um, they, what was great was seeing that dissipate slowly mm. over the course of the first half. So the first half, it was kind of like a silent symphony descended upon White Hart Lane where you could just <laughs> suddenly hear the away fans in, in full voice um, drowning out, you know, 55,000 Tottenham fans. The sound of the second half was different because mm. it was the howls of frustration as Spurs kind of tried to claw their way back into the game, but realised it was ultimately futile. And, you know, brilliant noises, like the noise the Spurs fans made when Sessegnon failed to control a ball and it went out for a throw-in, you know? <laughs> Just like genuine sort of like apoplexy and anger. Mm. Um, and then that sight, that glorious sight, as we sort of ticked into the last 10 minutes of the game of all around me, Tottenham fans standing up, beginning to sort of file out of the stadium, mm. despondent and defeated. Demented and a, by despair. Indeed. And then, exactly, driven into acts of madness. I mean, with what happened yeah. after the full-time whistle. And I, I listen, I'm sure we will talk about it, but I don't want it in any way to detract from the 90 minutes, which were fantastic for an Arsenal fan but yeah you know seeing that unfold and then watching Arsenal's response the scale of the celebrations I think Arsenal would have celebrated an away win at Spurs regardless but mm -hmm. I am convinced that that was like an incendiary moment you know much like uh Mauricio Tirico, uh, yes, irritated Thierry Henry back in 2004. And so they decided to go out on the pitch and celebrate. Arsenal planted their flag at Tottenham Stadium and, well, and hoisted their scarf over the spider cam. <laughs> yeah, they sure did. I saw video of Gabriel Martinelli having a couple of goes uh, at getting it up there, but he, he, uh, he got there in the end. I think you're right, though. I think there would have been celebrations, and of course there should be celebrations. When you win a North London derby, when you know, you're know you laying to, to bed a, a few ghosts from a few short months ago, really. You know, it's only six, seven months since that game in May. Yeah. But it's a long time since we won there in the league. You well, know, yeah, but. 2014. Mikel Arteta yeah. was was a player that day uh, when Thomas Rosicki scored. So, you know, it's it's overdue. I was talking about this a bit in the in the build up to the game that it is overdue. It felt overdue, but of course, you can't ever really be 100 percent certain because of the, the sort of the the energy that a derby has, right? Mm -hmm. um, I know we've probably talked about this before, but do you remember when we were? you know, by far, man for man, a much better team than Tottenham. You know, when we had the likes of Bergkamp, Vieira, Henri, Perez, Jumberg, and they had, um, I don't know, Chris Armstrong and Tariko, who you mentioned, sure. and, and Gary Doherty and, and people like that. <laughs> Stefan yeah. Freund, you know what I mean? It's like, you, you people aren't even fit to lace their boots, but... The games themselves were quite often very tight because of mm -hmm. the the fact it's it's a derby. So 
you know, you can never be 100% sure how things are, are going to go in a game like this. And, um, you know, I thought the fact that we got on top pretty quickly was really important because we know they've been slow starters. I think they would have been told, don't have a slow start today. You can really change the energy of of our season, the way we're perceived as a team, you know, a second half team where, where you know, we have a poxy first half and then we come back or we try and come back and play a bit better in the second half I mean that has been Spurs season but there's no way they would have deliberately um, chosen to to play the way they did in that first half and I think huge credit has to go to Arsenal for the bravery the precision the the way at times even in those early um little interchanges where the game is settling down a bit. There were a couple where Spurs tried to press and I think Zinchenko actually had the ball in the left back position. I was thinking, well, he might, you know, just get rid of this. Knight plays a ball inside. We work it across midfield and we get it across to the right hand side and all of a sudden Sack is in a load of space. I think the way that Arsenal played it put me in mind of what Mikel Arteta said last season. Remember going into this game where he said, We are gonna go there, we're gonna play our game. Yeah. And maybe it wasn't quite the right thing to do with the personnel we had available to us on the day. But when you've got that personnel, when you've got that back four who who are, you know, uh, they beautiful combinations, you've got the partnerships, you've got the, the I don't know, the otherworldliness of Zinchenko, who is a, such a, I don't know how to describe him. Um, he's astonishing, really, in, in the way that he... Uh, influences our game and and how we play yeah. you you can go there and play that way and that just immediately put them on the back foot and that was evident right through the right through the first half yeah I, I remember about sort of 10 minutes into the game thinking Arsenal have really settled here and you know Spurs I do think Conte sets up you know quite negatively and mm-hmm. actually like I think it impedes them a little bit and their team selection there were some interesting choices I mean he made Picked Cessna on over Perisic, which I know a lot of Spurs fans were unhappy with. He went with Saar in midfield. It might have been his Premier League debut, first start, maybe. Yeah, I think so. You know, and it had more experienced options on the bench. They were hoping to have Benton Kerr fit, but he, he wasn't, fortunately for us. So I thought that handed us a little bit of impetus, just in terms of the starting 11s. But the Arsenal absolutely came and played their game. I thought it was an exemplary mm. first half. They showed exactly what they're about front to back. You know, I thought it was interesting. Again, one of those moments where you find yourself thinking, I would have, wouldn't have minded the Amazon team being in that dressing room today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a photo, a great photo of Gabrielle at full time in the back in the dressing room, you know, shirt off celebrating, but just on the wall behind him, uh, kind of above the clothes pegs and things of the away dressing room, there's uh, something posted and it just says identity in red letters. Right. And and the red letters are kind of comprised of the Arsenal first team squad. So like all the first team players are used to write out the letters identity. And, you know, it's like, a, a bit of insight into yeah. what the pregame thinking was. And again, people will say, this is just, you know, theatre. This is just, you know, uh, frippery. But it's working. Ar- <laughs> Arsenal went out there, and and their identity could not have been more clear. You I, know? Yeah, I agree. They I- were themselves, and they were the best version of themselves. Particularly in that first forty-five minutes, they showed absolutely what they're about, and the way in which they played. You know, normally in a derby, you're right; the game's close. Uh, it's an equaliser. You've mm. got the home crowd, the home stadium. Arsenal just went out there and played like that didn't mean a thing to them. Like they knew they were better and they showed Spurs and they showed, you know, those 50 odd thousand Spurs fans in that stadium that they were the better team. And it was, it was so, I was so proud watching them play because I was like, the the eyes of uh, the Premier League are on this game. Everyone knows the North London Derby is a game you've got to watch. It's always entertaining. It's always good value. Mm. And Arsenal just stepped up to the plate. They took the stage. They took the spotlight. And it, it, identity, I think, was the key word. You know, no one could fail to watch that and 
not think, wow, this is impressive. Yeah. I'm sure even a uh, little Ukrainian lad called Mikhailo Mudrik was thinking that, you know? Well, so, fuck him. That's all I can say about that at this moment in time. Yeah, um, I mean, it was <laughs> it was fantastic. And, it was, um, yeah. But yeah, but, I, it, it was it was just like a, it, it, as you said, even from the way we played out from the back all the way until what we did in the final third. I mean, I was taking notes during the the game and always trying to sort of note things down for writing up a piece or for doing the pod. And every time I looked up, it felt like Saka was on the ball in their half. Yeah. We just kept, we just dominated the space. Yeah, it, I mean, it was. Um... What I liked about it as well was the fact that we could sense a nervousness or a lack of confidence in Tottenham. And look, Lloris made a mistake early on, which led to a chance for Eddie. Um, I think the the ball took a long time to come down, which allowed Lloris to get back and make the save. But yeah. there's one of their most experienced players having a rick in, what, the sixth or seventh minute of the game. And... Rather than them saying, okay, we'll settle now. That's not great, but look, let's let's move on. Because I think there were a couple of moments even in the first half when when Arsenal, you know, there was a couple of wayward passes, a couple of things didn't go quite our way, but it never phased us. That's the thing. It never phased us. Whereas with Tottenham, you could see it absolutely got to them. The goal that they conceded, another huge mistake from, from Lloris. But, mm. you know... He didn't defend Saka. Sessegnon was obviously right. I'll show him onto his right foot. What's the worst he can do with the right foot? Never really tried to make a tackle or anything like that. Um, you know, so there was a standoffishness. There was a weakness in Tottenham that we saw and we exploited and we made the most of. So it wasn't just about playing the kind of football that we know we can play. It's about kind of turning the screw on them and just bossing the game uh, which was played primarily in in their half of the pitch for almost the entirety of the first half. Yeah, territorially. I mean, I think possession was pretty even, but it it was the space and the threat that Arsenal carried. And I mean, this is an Arsenal podcast, not a Spurs co- podcast, but I feel like I've said on it so many times over the last few years that Lloris is a problem for them. Um, mm. Fortunately for us, he's their club captain and they gave him a new contract not that long ago. So Isn't Kane the um, captain? Uh, I, I think it's Lloris. I might be wrong. I, I, maybe they've changed it. Oh, no, it's Harry Kane now. You're right. Yeah. Forgive me. It was Lloris. Right. Um, so they've got something right. They took it off him. But um, are you, uh, Captain Fl- I don't know. I who genuinely cares? don't care, actually. Yeah, yeah. Who gives a fuck? Yeah, who gives a shit? He's one of their captains, anyway. Um, it, yeah. I, you know, that set a few jitters, I think, that early mm. mistake. And if that drops to Eddie's right foot rather than his left, maybe he scores. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it took a long time to come down as well. It wasn't I don't think it was quite as easy as it looked. But yeah, that, that immediately made them nervous. And I agree, Arsenal weren't 100% clean. There was a few misplaced passes. Thomas Partey, I thought, you know, just once or twice looked a little bit casual in possession, maybe. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, the, we, we got the early goal and that... As I said, you know, the symphony of silence was created. And and Cessna tried to show Saka down the line. But, I mean, I'm not even thinking about this very hard. I can think of Crystal Palace uh, on the opening weekend of the season. Yeah, same kind of thing. down the right. We we got the goal off the own goal. I can think of Ellen Road, him being sent onto his right, smashing it into the roof of the net. It doesn't work with Bukayo Saka. Mm. You can try and force him onto that foot, but he's good enough to still make things happen from that position. Um, so yeah, and, and an ideal start really. And I think, you know, it, it just, we were already playing with confidence, but it just injected even more. Yeah. There was, I mean, the thing you would say about Spurs, right, is that because of the, the quality on paper anyway, that they have up front, they are a moments team, a team that can, 100%. can and always dangerous. Yeah. 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 Annoyingly. Because, like, it's a huge, huge moment in, is it about five minutes after we scored? Even after less, we went ahead. Is it even, even less? less? Uh, let me just have a look here. Goal 14, and then 18 minutes. I've got it here on the live blog. Mm. A chance for Son. And look, it's sharp movement in the box. Um, he got yeah, away pass, from the yeah. defenders. Good pass. But that, you know, that's a moment in a game like this which can absolutely change the game. 
change the momentum of the game, change the atmosphere in the stadium. You know, if Son scores there, that's like one of those, and I think we've experienced it before, where we've gone ahead at White Hart Lane and pretty quickly let one in. Mm. And it's a big, big save from Aaron Ramsdale. Mm -hmm. And I know we're going to talk about other things, and there are plenty of other things to discuss. But I think it's it's a weird one, right? Because I, you look at the two teams and the way the game went, and I think it's obvious that Arsenal were the better team mm -hmm. by a yeah. long way. Deserved the win. No two yeah. ways about it. And yet, our goalkeeper is possibly the standout player. Man of the match. He was awarded by Sky. He made a number of big saves. Mm -hmm. He, I think that's his best game. I think that's his best ever performance for Arsenal. And in the context of this season, this particular fixture, and... At moments in the game where things could have swung in a way that, you know, we've seen happen in football matches time and time again, where a team is on top or a team is ahead, and then it just takes a moment, just takes a second, just takes a goal, just takes, you know, one kick, and the whole thing can flip on its head and go the other way, and all of a sudden you're you're sort of... Um, you're biting your nails and everything else, right? So I think in the context of all of that... The performance that he put in was absolutely unbelievable. And not just with the saves. I don't think it's just the saves. Lloris at the back was nervy for them. He booted it long. His distribution was poor. You know, he didn't look comfortable under crosses. We swung a couple of corners in under the bar and he was nowhere near them. Ramsdale made brilliant saves, but he also dominated his area when he needed to. You know, when the ball was there to be caught, he caught it. When the cross was there to be claimed, he claimed it. He settled us. He helped us settle and, and stay in control and stay calm. And like, I, you know, I gave everyone 10 out of 10 on the player ratings on Arsbog News, but I would definitely have given Ramsdale 11 if I could, because I think he was that good. Yeah, he, he was fantastic. And I agree with you. He might have made better saves in the game than the one from Son, but I don't think he made a bigger or more important mm. one. Because the Sessing they... one maybe, you know, is is similar yeah. in, in terms of the timing that that came in the in the second half. True, true. I mean, the, you're right. These are the moments on which games can hinge. And if they equalise at this point in time, it ignites the crowd. Suddenly they've got the momentum. You would have been better off staying at nil-nil in some respects, mm. you know, than giving them an equaliser a few minutes after you've taken the lead. Um, so that was a big moment. And you know, this was, it's been an interesting season for Ramsdale because actually the way in which the team has played has afforded him much more protection than he had last season. And he's been mm. called upon to make much, many fewer saves. Um, and so it's been a lot less showy, I think, mm -hmm. in a lot of respects. But, Today was a day where he did need to step up. He did need to make saves and he did it. The other thing I would say about him is uh, leaving aside all the kind of shithousery and stuff, which, you know, is great. And this sort of, you know, what we'll see this day kind of pass into Arsenal folklore, I think, in some respects. But it's very interesting. If you look at the goalkeepers at the top end of the Premier League, um, the likes of Alisson, Lloris... Uh, De Gea, uh, Kepa. No one is doubting that these guys are absolute quality. But if you look back over the last couple of months, even, you will see massive goal giving ricks from all of them. And I do think it's quite amazing that even though Ramsdale has games where you think, ah, maybe he could have done a bit better on that shot, or he could have done a bit better on that incident, and we all like hyperanalyze. He's about two years or so, you know, a year and a half into his time with Arsenal. And at 24, one of the youngest goalkeepers in the in the league, he doesn't really do that. Like, mm. he doesn't really make the big errors that you see some of the most uh, celebrated goalkeepers in the world making. And I just think at a young age, that is pretty impressive. And I think obviously that's something that goes unnoticed. But on a day where like it is a more showy performance, yeah, 
and you look at what happens at the, to the goalkeeper at the other end, I think it is worth highlighting. And the the other, I think that's absolutely right. And the other thing I should mention is, you know, the the save from Kane at the end of the first half. Yeah, again, yeah. again another that's a massive, the timing, the of that timing is really of that. The, yeah, it's exactly that. You know, all of a sudden you're you're thinking, right, we're going in two nil. I think it was. I mean, this is. Uh, Zinchenko, you know, he's just so brilliant and so technically accomplished, but he just has these little fluffy moments. And he had a little fluffy moment and, um, you know, it was a good cross in. And it was, a you know, a, a brilliant save again, probably one you would expect him to make. Mm. But again, the timing of it, the importance of that. So it's 2-0 at halftime and not 2-1, you know. Um, I think it just feeds into the overall... Um, a sense that I have, like that this is a this is a goalkeeper pretty near the top of his game, and I think in the past he has spoken a little bit about how when um, you know he likes to be involved in games, he likes to sort of keep himself focused, and he'll have a bit of whatever with a player or the the other fans to sort of keep himself focused in games like this. But when he was called upon, he was called upon more times than you might like even, but he delivered. He was just great. Absolutely, absolutely superb. Um, what of else? Course. Go on. Well, I mean, we must talk about uh, Arsenal's second goal. Mm. I'm just thinking, so some went through... Um, then I think there was the Odegaard chance uh, not long after that where, where he shot from range and Lloris made Saved. the save. Partey's unbelievable yeah. shot. Um, uh, yeah, phew. that would have uh, lived long in the memory for sure. sure. Would. Um, that Odegaard one, by the way, was a brilliant move. It was mm. one of those where Zinchenko, I think it was that moment where he just accelerated away from a couple of men on the left-hand side. And mm -hmm. uh, it was one of the things that made you kind of double take of like, oh, right, okay, you can do that as well. Um, <laughs> he, I mean, we've got questions about him, but yeah. he is just an utterly fearless footballer. Um, and then, yeah, 35 minutes was 2-0. There or thereabouts. Yeah. I mean, there was a lot of... Uh, discussion afterwards on Sky, I don't know if you saw it, but like Paul Merson was talking about Lloris just hoofing the ball. He said it was a 1989 goal kick yeah, uh, straight uh, out of the hands uh, of the goalkeeper. I didn't, I haven't watched the Sky coverage yet. And believe you me, I will be watching it today mm. at some point. But it was interesting. Like this is another respect in which I do think this, you know, match of the day called it a tale of two goalkeepers. You know, it's always cruel to make individual analysis, uh, you know, like that. But Loris had the ball in his hands and he was kind of shrugging his shoulders like, you know, what's the pass? What's mm. on? And he genuinely did. Do you remember on Twitter there was a, a, a compilation like sometime last season of like, I think it was goalkeepers in the 90s just hoofing the ball. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it was like Dave Besson, you know, just booting it 80 yards up the pitch. And this was one of those. And... You know, that is something Arsenal have gained as well with someone who can really distribute. But you also have to say, it's not like he rolled it out to us six yards out and we stuck it in the net. In the net. No. We still produced an end-to-end -end move that was brilliant. Yes, it's true. I mean, Saliba really monstered Harry Kane in the air. Saliba and Gabriel, both. But Saliba in the air, um, you know, won a lot of headers. Uh, he won the header party to Saka, Saka to Odegaard. It's one of those where you look at it in real time and you go, oh my God, what a great hit that is. But then when you see a couple of the angles behind you, like if that was your goalkeeper, would you have been unhappy? Uh, I think it's it's not in the corner, is it? It's not in the corner. It's it's a good hit from Odegaard. Mm, but it bubbles a bit, you know? It's not yeah. It's not like a daisy cutter um, in the traditional sense where you just sort of smash it and it just fizzes across the grass. It does sort of bobble a little bit. Maybe that made it more difficult for Lloris. I don't know. But look, I'm taking nothing away from Martin Odegaard, who deserved his goal. And it's amazing. Six of his eight goals in the Premier League this season have come away from home. Yeah, that's amazing. You know, which is an incredible return from a player, you know, who we all wanted to see shoot more and score more. So to step up, but also to step up away from home, which is it is more difficult. That's the reality of it. It is more difficult. Um, so I don't want to take anything away from, from Odegaard. And I think it was a deserved goal. But I do wonder, you know, 
I don't care what Spurs fans think, but I bet there's a, f- a few of them this morning who aren't happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> Good. I, I, sorry, just the, 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 the <laughs> me imagining. Like, I almost wish, like, I'm almost tempted to go and listen to Spurs podcast today. Do you know that feeling of like, <laughs> I, I just want to hear how sad they are. But um, I think it there's would only, be too much even yeah, for me. There's only so I'm far sure, I can push it. <laughs> I'm sure some diligent Arsenal fans will go out and, you know, clip up the best of YouTube and podcasts and make it available to us all so we don't I've, have to I've actually. Or, I've already seen the, the someone did it with the, you know, the, the two lads. I think they're yeah. brothers. And they're like, yeah. <laughs> they're just standing there, just like, and it's like, oh, I think it's an own goal. Oh, the, the, yeah, I don't know why they do that to themselves. Why do they keep doing it to themselves? I, I mean, don't know. I mean, for our entertainment, I, I guess. guess. But, um, I, yeah, I loved Odegaard taking that on as well. You know, he had Martinelli outside him, and I mm. sort of, he sort of moved as if he was going to play it. Took the shot on as he had, you know, ten minutes before, and yeah. he pulled a save from Lloris. This time, uh, Larissa's uh, creaking bones couldn't get down there. <laughs> and uh, great goal. Just, to, uh, yeah, listen, they were having the Odegaard's little celebration. I love his little run as he runs away from goal where he does the couple of sort of slalom runs, you know, just mm. to kind of extend the celebration. And after both goals, there was these there were these huddles, particularly after the first goal. Arsenal went into a big, big huddle for quite a long time. And... You know, again, all those key messages, the same ones mm. that were probably pinned up all around the dressing room being reiterated. I think, you know, we're going to talk about Ramsdale. We're going to talk about uh, Zinchenko today, but we shouldn't overlook Martin Odegaard, who I just think is playing at an astonishing mm. level right now. Yeah. I mean, there aren't, there just aren't many players who have his level of technical ability on the ball and, and the way in which he's stepping up to his role in this team is uh, sensational. Yeah, he's the most informed player in his position in the Premier League by by some distance. And when you consider some of the players that you know he might be in inverted commas competing with, mm-hmm. it really does tell you um, you know how well he's playing and how how valuable his his contributions are. And when you look at the the celebrations for the second goal, it's every single outfield player is there in that huddle. Every single yeah. one of them is there. Yeah. Um, and yeah. Ramsdale's probably in front of the Spurs fans, <laughs> sure. uh, yeah. given it, having it smuggled his, his tongue into the stadium. Yeah, give me a... Uh, yeah, the tongue of dog, tongue of Ramsdale, no doubt. Um, yeah, there were some good pictures of him, actually. Um, so, look, we talked about Ramsdale making the save to keep it 2-0, and I think I expected a bit more from Tottenham in the second half just simply because they would have gone in at halftime. They're 2-0 down at home. You expect a manager to rouse the players. You expect the players to want to give a better account of themselves. And I think there was more about them in the second half. Yeah, they couldn't be quite that bad again, um, I don't think. I think, you know, unless they wanted to have their fans Mm. running onto the pitch and kicking them, they needed to, you know, produce something in that second half. <laughs> and they did. They had shots. You know, we talked about the Sessegnon one. Have you seen the replay of Ben White? Yes, I thought it was a very good save Marin Ramsdale, but now I realise it was Ben White <laughs> <laughs> screaming at Sessegnon. <laughs> it's such playground stuff. Yeah, I, like, love it. I love it. Miss it. Miss it. Jinx. Jinx. Yeah, jinx. Whatever it was. <laughs> um. It's great. Yeah, I love that clip. And uh, it goes into the sort of Ben White Hall of Fame. Um, yeah, that was, a, that was a good chance and a really, really good extended leg to save. Mm. Um, trying to think of, I mean, you know, Kane had a shot that was, you know, yeah, turned it? away. Yeah. Um, there were a couple of other uh, moments. You know, they were more threatening. They did play with a greater level of intensity. Um but, uh, you know, we had chances on the break too. Mm. And, um, you know, I think that the, the key one was with about 20 minutes left on the clock, the, the one that came to Eddie and Ketia, um, which was the chance really to yeah. get the glory that probably his all-round performance deserved. Yeah, I think so. Uh, it would be a shame if that miss was what defined his performance yesterday because 
I thought he was I thought he was fantastic. You know, I really did think he put I thought he put in a big shift against Newcastle. Same again yesterday. He was he, really up for it. He like really he, was, but he was really sharp, wasn't he? He was kind of first to things. He won a number of free kicks around the box. But there was a great moment. It could have been in the first half. Again, Ben White is involved. Where Spurs get down the left-hand side, they sort of bypass. They might bypass Saka. I think it's Sessegnon. And who's there to make a sliding challenge? Eddie and Kedia in the right-back position. And Ben White is like, yeah, you know, as he makes that as he makes that challenge. I thought his performance deserved a goal. I think he will probably have gone to sleep last night replaying that one in his mind a few times because it was a it was a good ball in from Shaka. His first touch just wasn't quite what it should have been. Mm. And I think if it had been a better first touch, he has a much better angle than to just slide the ball beyond Lloris rather than try and lift it over him with defenders heading back towards the line. But yeah, he 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 had a great game, I think, Eddie. He really did. He, I mean, he, the thing is, that chance, it's a great ball from Shaka. It slightly mm. skips off of the ground. I think Eddie would... Uh, to be honest, I think Eddie would expect to score that and the first half chance um, from the Lloris mm. mistake. You know, I think he's got very high expectations of his own finishing and his ability in the box. One thing I would say, that second chance comes, you know, I think 68, 69 minutes on the clock. Maybe that touch is a bit weary because he is working so hard right now mm. for the team. And that was one of the conclusions, you know, no doubt we'll talk about transfer business and, and Mudrick and things like that. But had Arsenal had even a fitter Emil Smith Rowe or just the fresh legs to inject mm. some new impetus into that attack? I think there's every chance they would have taken Spurs apart on the break um, yeah. in those finals because they had to go for it. And I, there was acres of space. And the, the front three, Martinelli, Saka, Smith Rowe, uh, and, and Nketiah, sorry, covered so much ground and, and worked so diligently. But in that final stretch of the game, you could see just a little bit of fatigue I, naturally. Yeah, I think that's, you're right. It's natural. And this is where, you know, when we had discussions about Eddie replacing Gabriel Jesus, my, not my main concern, but one of the concerns was like, how much of a burden are you putting on Eddie to do that kind of running, you know, um, having just come into the team, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, I think we all recognize the need for more depth in the attacking uh, part of the squad. Um, but I think you're right to say, yeah, by the end, he was, you know, he was tired. And I think that's understandable when you've run the way he ran in that North London derby, when you've played pretty much every minute of every game since you since you came back in. It's understandable to be a little fatigued, um, but... Look, he did a he did a big job for us yesterday, and I think he he really is doing his best uh, to deputise for Gabriel Jesus in 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 terms of what he brings to the team. You know, we can all see that there's a a difference, but uh, you know, you cannot fault for one second uh, the effort and the endeavour, and and I think the quality of his all round game yesterday was was really really good. Yeah. Um, other moments of slight shithousery, they went a bit s strange on the television. When Martinelli uh, controlled the ball with his back. Mm. Did uh, they not like that? The no, Gary Neville didn't like it. Yeah, Gary Neville, he was like, oh, Romero doesn't like that. Oh. And it was like, all he did was, it wasn't like, who was the fucking Man United player who did the juggling in one of the FA Cup games at Old Trafford. Do you remember? He ran, Was it Nanny? I don't know if yeah, it was Nanny or... I think it was, yeah. And then and Anthony did the spin the other day. Yeah, Flamini tried to, like, basically remove his legs um, with a tackle that, that uh, thankfully, he missed. Um, but it wasn't anything like that. It was just just a control with his back. I don't know why they were getting so worked up about that. But... Um, I, I think Martinelli. I, yeah, I mean, listen, it, it was a bit of a, sh a bit of showboating. I don't know if he would have done it in another fixture. To mm. be honest with you, I think it was about being two 0 up. You know, uh, uh, away from home in the derby. Richarlison said after the game that he'd been giving Martinelli stick for going to ground too easily. 
Um, <laughs> Hello, Mr. Yeah. Pot, here's your friend, the kettle. Um, so I think maybe it was just sending a bit of a message. And also, I mean, you know, Gabby Martinelli's playing this game mm. um, off the back of all the Mudrick stuff. And I think I, I wouldn't put it past him to say that he was saying, look, I, I'm here. I am here. Mm -hmm. um, he doesn't start over me at this point in time. And I thought he he produced a really, like, like everybody, mm. a really strong performance. And I didn't mind it one, that one bit. And, you know, it was great to see them lose their heads. Well, I mean, the introduction of Richarlison went yeah. some way to making that happen because Throwing he was... A, a lit match, isn't it? Yeah, it's box. exactly. He was already... Like his head was gone before he even came on because there was a clip doing the rounds of Martinelli holding his hands out or holding a hand out to, you know, to say hello to a fellow Brazilian. Like could have been a bit of piss taking from Martinelli actually just before he's about to take a corner and we're 2 nil up and he wants like a handshake. Mm -hmm. So I don't necessarily blame Richarlison for that, but that was the biggest cheer that the Spurs fans had when Richarlison sort of denied the, the little fist bump thing. But he came on and within like a couple of seconds... um. There was an incident, I think Odegaard got taken out by Dyer or Longley or whatever it was. And Richarlison got involved. Longley, yeah. And <laughs> again, Ben White's face, when Richarlison is giving it like whatever he's giving, Ben White's looking at him like, what the, f <laughs> who the fuck are you? Which is brilliant. <laughs> but then, of course, you know, it, it, it feeds into what happened, I think, at the end of the game as well. Like, I don't think the fan tries to kick Aaron Ramsdale if Richarlison doesn't give it all that. I mean, Richarlison basically pushed him in the face. He, he, he you know, raised his hands. We've seen players sent off for less because, mm -hmm. you know, by the letter of the law, you can't raise your hands. He pushed Ramsdale in the face. Now, Ramsdale, of course, was just openly laughing at him, which was amazing. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, there's a the great image of as he takes the final goal kick it's the image for today's um podcast yeah i've got a screenshot of it and it's uh it's beautiful um yeah i mean you know it, it was it, the, the sort of needle was was very entertaining there was one point in the second half i don't know if the cameras picked this up where granite shaka and antonio conte yeah. having a full round <laughs> I love um, that as well. like screaming at each other and uh, Mikel arteta who obviously was had to kind of babysit Shaka later in the day, just furiously pointing at his temples, um, mm, keep your, to, keep and, and trying to calm Granite down. But uh, the other side of that is that Arsenal, I do think, were like pretty composed and de and defended their box really well when they needed to in the second half. Um, and there was one moment I really loved where a load of changes were made. I think it was after Kieran Tierney came on for uh, Martinelli, which was an interesting change, right? They it was, Tierney yeah. On, Do you think there was anything more in that than just, okay, let's bring on, let's bring on Tierney. Um, interestingly, who played ahead of Zinchenko, I thought they yeah. might swap a little bit, but, but no. I, I guess it's just, the, you know, Zinchenko so important to our build-up and they eventually brought Tommy Asu on didn't mm. they to to play in that position which I guess made a degree of sense because Kulisevsky was always coming inside um, but after they made that change there was a, uh, an exchange Odegaard was sort of running back to defend a corner and he sort of called to Arteta and they were just making these sort of gestures with their hands about like uh, what's the shape and I think it must have been out of possession because Arteta just gave him like 4-4-2 four, four, mm. with his fingers and Odegaard immediately was like great and it was like it was literally a two to three second exchange 60 yards apart on a football pitch mm. that immediately the team kind of calibrated and understood what was required and I just thought like between coach and captain it was a moment that sort of encapsulated the immediacy of understanding and sort of depth of knowledge the team have about this system and, and what Arteta's doing with it. Um, but mm. yeah, to come back to the end, I guess that that sort of level of composure was c completely absent in Spurs. And Well, yeah, particularly yeah. in a week where our discipline in inverted commas has been in the well, spotlight, you know, with two challenge, FA charges yes. and, and everything else. 
Uh, I know Arteta was asked about it before the game, and he, you know, he was not really buying into it. He wasn't. He wasn't. He wasn't going to do anything but play it down. But uh, you know, at the end, it was it was Tottenham who lost their heads. Um, not just the players, but a fan as well. And um, look for all the jokes. And as much as I kind of love to see that happen to them, I love to see them driven to absolute madness because of how good we are and everything else. Um, you know, there is a serious element to it where, you know, a fan has tried to or has assaulted a player and look, he'll get what what's coming to him, I'm sure. Um, but I think Spurs, to an extent, have to take some responsibility for that. Yeah. Like if I you're going... And if, they should be relegated. Yeah, and um, folded, basically. <laughs> No, I, I, there is definitely a serious side. And, you know, we saw that with the PFA statement which came out almost immediately um, about the welfare of players. It, it's something that has crept into the game more and more. Do you remember there was a spate, I think after uh, COVID ended and fans were allowed back in stadium, there was a kind of period of like a few pitch invasions and sort of similar incidents, not quite, mm. didn't go quite as far as anybody kicking anybody, but something that kind of crept in and then it, it got clamped down upon. I mean, there's just, it, it's just one of the, it, it just shouldn't happen. It just can't happen. Can it? No, 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 no. It's, it's completely out of order. Um, and I know that they might say, well, Ramsdale was winding us up the whole time or he was winding us up at the end there. And it's like, well, that's not it. If you're standing behind a goal and you're shouting and look, this isn't just what Tottenham fans do. It's what all football fans do. Right. You know, mm -hmm. they will fucking shout and scream and abuse and banter or whatever you want to call it, right? Um, but if the player that you're abusing gives you a tiny bit back and that sends you over the edge to the point where you're rushing down the stands and, you know, I mean, it was just such a pathetic, cowardly little sly kick in the back, wasn't it? You know, it wasn't even like... Come on, Ramsdale, I'll fight you, mano a mano. It was just sly and cowardly and uh, and everything else. Um, but, like, I, 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 again, I don't think it would have happened if Richarlison had just left well enough alone. No, so I think that's true. I, I think Richarlison should be relegated too, and um, the stadium turned into a giant He, sh he should also be dissolved, Richarlison, <laughs> in, a in a vat of acid. No, I <laughs> Um, I think it's, yeah, listen, it, it, the thing is, like, it reflects badly on Spurs. Uh, and so I, I sort of don't mind it, if you see what I mean. Sure. I know what you uh, mean. I mean, uh, one thing we haven't really spoken about is, aside from the importance of the derby itself hmm. and how much is... Um, you know, how s the stakes are always really high in a game like this every season. It doesn't matter if you're top of the table or bottom of the table. When it's a derby, you know, you want to win it, and that's huge. But what happened in the Manchester derby yeah. was another aspect to this, and not for the first time this season, Arsenal have responded to an opportunity uh, that has presented itself when results have gone, other results have gone our way. And I think this was this was a really, really big derby win. No question about it. First time we've won there since 2014 and all the rest. In the context of this season, it's a big win away from home. But it, f it really feels like something a bit more, this one. You know what I mean? Because of what happened uh, in, in the Manchester derby, because of City dropping points, there was something extra at stake and we've we've taken it you know it's ours now to to run with and we'll see how the rest of it goes but this felt much more than just a north london derby win it did it did and before the game i kind of had a little thought to myself where i thought if arsenal win this game and I'm almost not going to finish the end of that sentence mm. but i'm sure you can all fill the gaps in because I'm sure the thought was crossed other people's minds. Mm. It did feel like there was a big prize at stake, more, even bigger potentially than 
you know, North London Pride and three points. Sure. Um, and let's just say I don't think there's anyone at this point in time who isn't taking Arsenal very, very, very seriously. Apart from Gary season. Neville, it seems. But... Apart from Gary Neville, yeah, who I saw before the game saying like, well, will United, uh, will Arsenal like that United result, you know? And I was like, well, I mean, yeah. They listen. They pro- maybe they would have preferred a draw, just in terms of building a bit of a gap from two teams. But mm. the chance to go eight points clear. I mean, if you'd offered anyone that scenario at the start of the weekend, yeah, they yeah, would have yeah. been over the moon, over the moon. Um, and don't pay any attention to Pep Guardiola conceding the title when he says we cannot win the title. Blah blah blah. No, don't. No pay even the slightest bit of attention to that because, you know, there's still two games against Man City to play. And they have a tremendous record against us. Yeah. Um, um, but, you know, this is the season where Arsenal finally beat Liverpool. This is the calendar year in which Arsenal went and won twice at Stamford Bridge. This is the season where we went to White Hart Lane and won for the f- first time in the best part of a decade. Mm. We are breaking a lot of bad habits right now. And so I don't think anyone at Manchester City will look at those two games at Arsenal and take anything for granted at all. And there's a lot of other games to come as well. Mm. So, uh, yeah, this was a really big win, a really big step. And actually, like uh, the temptation is to talk about this season and what does it mean for the title? And there's, there's no doubt we're in a great position a really strong position but watching us play the way we did at White Hart Lane in a funny way I became more relaxed about the title this season because I thought I don't think Arsenal are going away like the way we played in this match and the level of talent that we have in the, on the players on the pitch and the coach on the touchline who who stock in world football must be mm-hmm. incredibly high right now. Mm-hmm. The, the contract that Arsenal gave him at a time when they were criticised in some circles for doing so because they had not yet secured top four looks like a very smart move at yes. this point in time. Sure does. But I was watching it unfold and thinking, yeah, we might win the league this season. We might not. But I don't think, I don't think it's necessarily our only chance. Like, I think looking at this team, looking at this group, looking at the purpose with which they play, the commitment and the age, we might not just be having a good year. Mm. We might be at the start of three or four or five good, good years, a good, good time to be an Arsenal fan. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that, that this is not just a one-season wonder thing. It's it's not Leicester. It's not less. No, we did have a couple of questions about that, and I, I was reluctant to sort of to ask because I don't think it is a Leicester thing. I think that was a unique concurrence of events in the Premier League. But what Arsenal have been doing, very obviously, for the last eighteen months, two years, or you might even say under the uh, throughout the entire time Mikel Arteta has been here, has been working towards something working towards improvement and building a team that that can be competitive at the top of the table, um, which is where, you know, Arteta said he always wanted us to be. So I think you're right. Um, we all know what's possible this season and, and fingers crossed and, and everything else, but it is so encouraging for the seasons to come. You know, if we can keep this group together and if we can continue to recruit well and add well, you know, this is going to be a competitive team. Yeah. And that's and, and something we should, we should enjoy. There'll be, there'll be seasons where other teams uh, are more strong than this year. And it's a very competitive league. Mm. But I just think that was my big feeling actually watching the game and thinking like, this is, this is really real. This isn't a freak run. This isn't fluke mm. or luck. We are outplaying team after team after team. And we're doing it over a long, consistent period, many months, Mm -hmm. many, many months. And um, if you go back to the start of last season, 
you know, there's, yes, there've been some hiccups and deviations and bad moments along the way, but the trend is really, really clear and it's really been sustained. And I, I think it will continue to sustain. And that's really exciting. Yeah, sure is. Okay, look, we should take a break because we've got plenty of questions. You mentioned transfers and, and those kinds of things. Um, mm-hmm. And no doubt there'll be... We have to talk about that. We yeah, do have sure. to talk about um, all of that. So we'll do that. We'll take a short break here. It was a great day yesterday. And who better to take us into the break than the man himself? It's a great day. Welcome back to the Arscast Extra. This is part two of the show where we answer the questions that you send us on Twitter, at Gunnarblog and at Arsblog, also on the Arsblog Discord chat server, which you get access to if you are an Arsblog member on Patreon. We do have questions about transfers. We do have questions about Mikhailo Mudrik. Um, mm. But I think it, it's a situation that probably merits a little bit of discussion before we get into the questions, because, you know, there was a, a, a general sense that Arsenal were inching towards getting this particular deal done. There was talk of Chelsea interest. It seemed to go away after the Zhao Felix thing. And then it came back with a vengeance on on Saturday evening, Chelsea getting the deal done, um, 100 million euros, which is what Shakhtar wanted. Are you surprised that it played out this way? A guy who had been very publicly twerking for Arsenal yeah. all of a sudden ends up at at Stamford Bridge um, you know not a great place for a Ukrainian international I would have thought given the history of that club but there you go that's a different thing um, what's your understanding of how it all went down just Chelsea said here's everything you want and here's a gigantic enormous lengthy contract for you Mr. Mudrik <laughs> Well, it, it is, you asked me, you know, you said it was a surprise. I think it was a surprise. I think it was a surprise to everyone at Arsenal in some respects. I mean, you're correct that Chelsea's interest, while it had been there, had never progressed significantly in terms of an official offer or anything like that. And Arsenal absolutely believed they had the commitment of the player. Um, Chelsea swept in. They move very quickly. Mm. Uh, face-to-face talks, uh, I think, took place in Turkey. Um, and they had a deal within a matter of hours. They made a presentation, a pitch to the player. And he was convinced to to do it. Mm. Um, was Edu in Poland? Because there was reporting that... I don't know. I don't think... I, I'd be surprised. I'd be surprised. Only in that... If he may have been, I I, I didn't hear it, it myself, and we didn't report it. Mm. Um, I mean, I I think Poland was a bit of a red herring because I think that the, the the key people for Shakhtar were in Turkey, and in fact, the owner was not in Turkey. Um, he had the final sign off on the deal, but that was done over uh, a call. Uh, but by that point, everything was already agreed, and and Chelsea, you know. They have paid 100 million. It's 70 plus 30. Arsenal did everything they feel was in their power to sign this player. And as huge as that number sounds, that 70 plus 30, you know, I, I, I believe that Arsenal were prepared to match that. Um, what the difference between the bids was, was the speed of the initial payments, essentially. The the upfront portion of the fee, Chelsea were able to happen, make happen much quicker. Mm. And for Shakhtar, that was uh, preferential. They lost their cast case 
couple of days before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, where they were sort of asking for 40 million in damages from FIFA over losing players the previous summer. They didn't get that, left a big hole, obviously, in their finances, legal fees to pay as well on top of that. Um, Chelsea were able to deliver the upfront portion of the fee in a quicker fashion than Arsenal were able to deliver it. Uh, So Shakhtar preferred that, I think, as well. The Shakhtar-Arsenal negotiations had been tense, and difficult. Protracted, obviously, because they've been going on for for weeks. Frustration on both sides. So I think Chelsea swooping in um, maybe was preferential in some ways to them. And for the player, I think, you know, clearly personal terms were more attractive and on the representative side, uh, the same case. So Arsenal yeah. were prepared to push the boat out for Madrid. I mean, they were prepared to pay a club record fee for this player and they didn't get him. And it's a huge testament to how highly they valued him that they were prepared to do that. And so I don't, you know, Arsenal won the derby and, uh, you know, it's it's a it ends up being a good weekend, but I don't want to downplay how much of a blow it was to people at Arsenal to, to not sign this guy. They really, really wanted him. Hmm. Um, and, 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 you know, there'll be a kind of post-mortem on that. You know, could they have acted differently? Could they have secured the deal with Shakhtar more quickly to avoid a scenario like this? Um, you know, was there confidence that they had the player maybe a little bit misplaced in the modern market where money does talk ultimately? I do think this was an extraordinary transfer. I mean, I think in years to come, there'll be case studies on this transfer, the way in which Shakhtar took an asset who they were negotiating to sell to Bayer Leverkusen at the start of the summer, last summer, for about 20 million euros. Um, And Leverkusen actually thought they had an agreement at one stage. And over the course of kind of six to six to nine months or whatever it's been, Mm. turned that into a hundred million pound asset. It is extraordinary, isn't it? It you is. Know, particularly you, I mean, you as... almost have to take your hat off to them. Yeah. And the fact that their technical director, I think I'm right in saying, was at Chelsea parading on the pitch at the unveiling, <laughs> demonstrates that Shakhtar think this is an incredible victory for them. And with everything that Ukraine has gone through, I mean, you can't begrudge them it. But the way in which the media, I think was used to amplify the profile and the price tag of this player is a very makes for a very 21st century mm. transfer and i've not i've not i don't know if i've ever seen a deal where i don't know where where all kinds of media were used to create uh, and inflate a price tag and I, and listen Arsenal were prepared to pay it when it got to the very death, when it got to the very end. But if you had told me in December that Shakhtar would end up getting their 100 million euros, I would not have believed you. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, the, 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 the contract, of course, eight and a half year deal yeah. from Mudrik, which is... An Which is an FFP workaround, basically. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a cheat, isn't it, really, in a way? I mean, it ties them into this player for that length of time. Yeah. And look... It allows you to amortize the, the fee sure, over that period. Sure, I get it. I think we all understand why it happens or why it's happened. But I don't think I've ever been as invested in a player flopping in my entire life like this. Yes. Um, well, what I, would, I mean, that would be good. What I would say is I don't think the wages are... I think it's a much higher offer than what Arsenal gave him. Mm. But I don't think they're uh, insane. And the reason for that is kind of twofold. One is that he was on you know, a Premier League pittance in the Ukraine. I mean, any jump to a Premier League wage was going to be significant for, mm-hmm. for Mudrik. But second of all, the lower salary is partly why... Arsenal were prepared to go as high as they were sure. on the fee. Because when you look at like uh, what they would have been paying him over five years, he, he would have worked out 
like a, a comparable, I need to run the numbers properly, but kind of a comparable signing to Gabriel Jesus if, right. in terms of cost. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, I do. I do. I, I'm so, just, yeah, go so, on. Yeah, I, I don't know what the value of that Chelsea contract is going to be, but I don't think it's going to be one of those eye-watering um, right. numbers. But yeah, it, it's... <sighs> what do you think this might do to the market? Because yeah, throughout, I mean, you, I think you're you're point about this being a case study is really interesting because he scored you know seven goals in the ukrainian league and three goals in the champions league two of which were against celtic i think right and all of a sudden a 20 million pound player is a 100 million pound player and they said all along well look if if manchester united pay 80 million for anthony then we think mudrick is better and blah 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 they said it very publicly they they did and they were consistent like He's second only to Messi and Messi and yeah, Neymar, which and- of course is bollocks. But you know what is to stop another club or every club now looking at that and saying, "Well, look, if a guy who's got less than fifty appearances for Shakhtar Donetsk is worth a hundred million, what's our guy worth? What's our <laughs> what's, what's our Gabriel Premier- Martinelli worth? Well, what's exactly. Bukayo what's Bukayo Saka worth? worth? What is you know what is uh, you know a Premier League proven English international worth now in this market where we know that the English tax is is hugely inflated? Like I I, I have to say, I find it astonishing in a kind of mind bending way that Chelsea were owned by Roman Abramovich for so many years but are somehow worse now. Like they're, they're, I've rekindled a lot of hate for Chelsea over the last little while. Um, yeah. the, the way that that club in the Abramovich era and now under this fucking big lump are just uh, impacting the transfer market in ways which, you know, it's, it's not healthy for the game. It can't be healthy for the game. So... I just don't know what to make of what's going to come next in the transfer market. And, and and it's a transfer market that we still have to be involved in. Yes, it does. Speaking to Amy Lawrence this morning and, you know, it's weird. It's like deja vu in mm. some respects, isn't it? Firing yeah. 50 pound notes. Feels like that all over again. Um it, I, I don't know what it will do to the market. And the problem you'll have is if, a Premier League club starts saying, well, look at what was paid for Mudrick. We think our player's worth a hundred million. And then you think, well, they're going to expect a high, you know, they're going to expect 250, 300 grand a week on top of that. Mm. Then at that point, these deals just become completely out of reach for a club like Arsenal, I imagine. Um, Unless it's really exceptional circumstances. Mm. And yeah, I I don't know. And it's in, it's interesting. I mean, thank God Arsenal won yesterday because it would have been a really difficult week for the club. Yeah. Had they lost out on this player and then, let's say, get beat by Spurs and Gabriel Martinelli goes off with a hamstring. You know, thank God, Touchwood, et cetera, all those things that that didn't happen because at least we're able to analyse and look at at it and talk about it and so are they internally from a more comfortable mm. position um the question now is is what next right yeah so we have a couple of questions on this so here's one from jonas stein who's on twitter at tromso jonas and he says should we stay true to our long-term vision of buying young and develop players or would it be wise in this particular transfer window with this extraordinary opportunity in the Premier League to buy proven and experienced Premier League quality like Zaha or Tielemans to add depth. And there were a number of questions on that. There was another one on the Discord as well. Uh, Big T says, uh, is it worth bringing in one or two mercenaries to try and get us over the line? Thinking Trossard and Tielemans uh, as examples of players, probably not in the long-term plan, but with so much on the line, uh, could Arteta integrate them, et cetera, et cetera. I don't necessarily think they would be mercenaries per se, but I think the, the question now is like, if Arsenal had the 70 plus 30 at their disposal or they were willing to do that on one player, what can they do with that money in this market 
for the overall squad? Like, what is the plan B? How many of the eggs were in the Mudrick basket? That's the question. And, you know, it doesn't alter the fact that, as we spoke about in the first half, there are... There's a heavy burden on the players that we have who are brilliant and have been fantastic, but, 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 you know, the schedule, Europe, FA Cup, big games, inevitable tweaks, injuries, suspensions, those kinds of things. The depth is what will make the difference between this season being as good as we would like it to be and not. That's my opinion anyway. Yeah, and it would be, it would be a, it would be tragic if we were not able to support the team and the manager appropriately. Mm-hmm. They they a hundred percent deserve more than a hundred percent deserve it. Yeah, and th- they need some help, and they've absolutely earned the right to ask for it. So, don't get me wrong. I I completely agree. Reinforcements are still required. Um, there are two difficulties, and I'll I'll do those bits first. One is uh, we've shown our hand to an extent mm-hmm. in terms of how far we were prepared to go for Mudrick. Um, and two, just scarcity in January is an issue. Um, it, it you know from our, for us as fans, we might look at it and say, "Well, just go and knock on people's door, make the offer," and then maybe a certain degree of truth in that. But certainly, the perception within the industry and and within the club is that the kind of premium quality they feel is needed to take the team forward is hard to find mid season. Um, but something has to be done, surely, because also. I hate saying this, but the Chelsea thing, it's a one-two punch because a fortnight ago, Arsenal really, really wanted to sign Jao Felix and Mudrik, you know? That that was not an implausible outcome of this window. And so to lose both to West London is painful. Um, But you have to be able to, you know... I think we've all enjoyed the fact that Arsenal have had a plan, a strategy, you know, that they've implemented in terms of recruitment, right? Mm -hmm. But I think you have to also be be willing, ready, able to pivot to to other things. And I made this point in writing in my piece for Athletic today, but you, you need only look at the heroes of the North London derby. You know, Aaron Ramsdale... Yeah, they really wanted him. But before him, they really wanted David Raya and they couldn't get him out of Brentford. Zinchenko, they wanted Lissandro Martinez mm. and the price went too high and the player chose Manchester United. And that's why we've got Zinchenko. Gabriel Jesus, if we'd signed Dusan Vlavic in the January window, maybe there is no Gabriel Jesus. I can't even imagine an Arsenal team with that guy in it at, at yeah. this moment uh, in time, you know? Uh, even Ben White. Ben White, they pushed the boat out for him. They loved him. But at the start of that summer, the conversations were, can we get Jules Koundé, who was at Sevilla at the time? So every player, you know, mm. almost all these signings were not the absolute number one first choice. Even Mudrick himself. If Arsenal had been able to agree a deal with Wolves for Pedro Neto in the summer, Mudrick wouldn't be in this conversation, right? Mm. So, unfortunately, Pedro Neto is still recovering from injury. I did, I did see that he's expected to return to training at the end of January, but I think that that's, that may be too late yeah, to help Arsenal. You know, we don't know what, what sort of condition he's coming back in. The point is, you often don't get your first choice, but. Arsenal have actually shown in these players that I'm talking about that they they can be really smart, they can be really sensible, and they can find alternatives. So I hope they can do that. Now, as for the question about mercenaries or, or Premier League experience, well, Premier League experience is something Arsenal value really, really highly. You know, look at some of the players that they've signed. Uh, and I think bringing someone in who knows the league and can hit the ground running could be very sensible. I mean, 
I think Zaha's a difficult one because he's out of contract at the end of the season and, and I think his intention is to get to that point in time and, and move as a Bosman, but you can always change people's mind with money. Just ask Chelsea. Um, uh, you know, there are other Premier League wide players on the market. Leandro Trossard is is one. Um, I saw David Ornstein report that Spurs have bid 12 million for him. I think Brighton would want double that to sell him. But that's not a deal out of reach for Arsenal if they decide to do it. Um, so, you know, there are players out there. And, and I think an interesting aspect of it is, does it change Arsenal's thinking in terms of, do they, is a wide man... Still, the absolute priority if Emil Smith Rowe is back, you know, is support for Eddie Nketiah also a consideration here? Mm -hmm. I think it should be. You know, I had to, they asked me today, and I said to write a little paragraph on what would be Arsenal's ideal January signing. And I said, well, for me, it'd be someone who could play wide and through the middle, you know, and mm. the name I plucked was, was Ferran Torres from Barcelona. Um, Someone like that who could play left, right and centrally. You know, Mudrick basically has played his whole career on the left wing. Someone who could do more than one of those jobs or two players who could fill those jobs. Mm -hmm. That would be great. In in the case of Torres, you know, Mikel Arteta loves him, but he's not been at Barcelona long. Very happy at Barcelona. So mm. tricky. But again, can money change people's minds? You never know. Um there's been talk about Rafinha, hasn't there? Again, he don't would like see to, that. Don't see yeah, that. He would like to stay at Barcelona. Uh, you know, it, I don't know what Arsenal's move is now. And if I'm completely honest, I imagine there's an extent to which they don't, because I think they'll want to take a breath after this. A lot of eggs were in this basket. Mm. And... I almost think we're into like a second window now. That That's the blessing. If this happened to Arsenal on deadline day... Yeah, we're in big trouble. It's a huge, huge problem. It's a big problem now, but uh, now we're actually... I know it doesn't feel like it because this saga has been going on forever. We're only at the halfway point of the window. Mm. So there is time for Arsenal to pivot. And don't get me wrong. I respect the club for having their principles, having their approach. But I do think they need to pivot here. Oh, in a big way. And I think uh, just a final thing on this, because we can move on to some other questions, because, you know, we don't have all the answers to this yet. And that will, no. will play out in time. I think there's something... When you consider how vocal consistently Mikel Arteta has been about what he wants when it comes to additions, right? Maximizing every window, more firepower, all of those things. This is a, as you pointed out in the first half, this is a manager whose stock is extremely high. Mm -hmm. And I think that has to be something that the club consider in terms of how they support him and how they give him what he wants. I'm not saying you should bend over and give every manager everything that they want. But this season, when we are where we are with an eight point lead, we're in the middle of January, there's two weeks to go through the lists of players that Arsenal are interested in and decide who's potentially gettable and who isn't and, and you know, what's a realistic deal and all the rest. Mm. I don't, I think it would be madness not just from the point of view of what it means for our season, but how maybe someone like Mikel Arteta might feel if he doesn't get the support he wants and needs to help Arsenal to a potential first title since 2004. That's an extra consideration now because of where we are. For me, anyway. I think you have to... I think to so. And, and Mikel Arteta, he was pretty classy you know, about the Mudrick thing when he was asked yeah, after the game, was, yeah. which maybe is easier uh, off the back of a massive victory like that. But he really uh, took the company line. Mm -hmm. I'm sure, I don't think it's, I don't think it's, I don't think it would be out of line to say this. I'm sure that privately he must be really frustrated. I'm sure he desperately wanted that new player to mm -hmm. give him that option, you know, ideally as soon as possible. Um, 
like I say, the team and the manager deserve that support. And I know it's not easy and I know I know it might require some deviation, but we've shown in the past that we can deviate from plan A and succeed. Mm. And and I think as well that that's what transfer strategy is, you know. You have a, a long-term overarching strategy, but it also requires you to move reactively and tactically. That sure. is the nature yep. of yep. sport. Yep, yep, yep. And that's as much part of it as anything else. So maybe you you do need a little bit of short-term thinking to go along with the long-term plan and help you along the way. So, yeah, let's see what the next few days uh, mm. bring. As I say, it's almost a, a sort of second window at this point now. All right. Well, let's see what they do. Um, let's have a, another few questions. Have you got anything that's non-transfer related? Yeah, I okay. do. There's, fortunately, there's a lot of... Uh, Derby questions. Um, well, listen, I, I, we've talked about him a bit, but I wouldn't mind talking about him more. Bar Parte says Jim Charles Moody, Jimmy Charles Moody, sorry, Jimmy. Is Zinchenko our most important player? Not on an individual skill level, but in terms of the team's tactical fluency. I mean, it's hard to say yes conclusively, but I think he is really important. Um, I think he's almost unique in a way. Yeah. Have you ever played chess? Yeah, I'm no good at it because you know what I can't do? What? I can't... Like, I think to be a good chess player, you have to see the move that your opponent makes, right? Mm. I can't do that. I'm rubbish at that. I can't <laughs> can't see. I just go, oh, look, there's my fucking castle guy. And then it's like, chuk, 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 uh, checkmate. Okay, fuck. Well, I, I was watching the game yesterday and I was thinking, Zinchenko is like the queen in chess. You know, like everyone else. You can move else, everywhere. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, the pawns are moving, you know, forward and backward. The, the or just forward, I think. The, the rook is you know, up and sideways, the knight moving in his strange little L shape. And then the queen, mm. the queen is going left, right, diagonal, backwards. She goes wherever she wants because she's the queen. Exactly. And Zinchenko, and I hope he takes it in the right way, is, is the queen of this Arsenal team. And I, 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 on, I honestly think... Like, I honestly felt like watching him yesterday, I was like, he's playing a different sport to some of these people. Like, what he's doing, his level of, uh, we talk about his technical skill, but his level of sort of tactical intuition on the pitch mm. is pretty unparalleled, I think. I, I could count on, like, one hand in my entire football-watching life you know, the amount of times where you would see your left back in the sort of right attacking midfield position, right? Yeah. And yeah. you know when it happens is like there's a set piece or a corner and all of a sudden Nigel Winterburn is covering somebody who's out right. of position, yeah, right? Yeah. But he's sort of drifting over, little ticky-tacky, playing wall passes with whoever he can fucking find to pay, uh, play them with. And then he'll sort of wander back to where nominally he's supposed to be on the pitch and this idea of like the inverted fullback is not necessarily a new one because City do it um you know Cancelo has done it quite a lot but but Zinchenko's sort of in an extra dimension of his own on the mm. pitch and I it must be confusing for the opposition to go, well, where's he? And look, I guess there's a downside that if the ball breaks down or if you lose the ball, there's probably a hole that they can exploit. But when you can demonstrate and, and show the measure of control that Arsenal did yesterday, it's an extraordinary weapon, if you want to call it that, to have. Like, the the what would you say the big difference between Arsenal this season and Arsenal last season was? I think there was improvement in Arsenal last season. For me, it's just control. How mm -hmm. well we can control football matches and periods in football matches. And even yesterday when, you know, Tottenham had a bit of dander up in that second half, 
all of a sudden Zinchenko gets on it or Odegaard gets on it. We play a few passes and we keep the ball and we take the, the flame down a bit, you know? That that ability to do that in games is is remarkable. Well, not remarkable, but I think it's the big improvement that we've made. Yeah, it is, and he's been a huge part of that. Um, and uh, you know, he's a, such a curious, curious player because there are these moments uh, where maybe defensively you think, oh, he's you know might not be the best one on one, or he gets a little bit overconfident. I mm-hmm. think sometimes because he's so good, there could like a moment of sloppiness, and all of those are just traded off by the control that he brings. Mm-hmm. And it's almost a cliche to say of a player, like, I didn't realise how good they were until they came. You know, we've said that mm. about players in the past. But in his case, I'm like, I had no idea he was this good. And I was thinking about it, like, I feel like in 90% of other teams, Zinchenko's probably playing number 10 and being heralded as you know, one of the best attacking <laughs> midfielders in the league and racking up goals and assists and things like that. You know, he's Martin Odegaard in 90% of other teams. There's a sort of glorious unselfishness about going, I'm going to stand at the back <laughs> and, like, just help the team completely dominate the first two-thirds of the pitch. Because Spurs played two midfielders yesterday, which was foolish anyway against the three of Partey, uh, Shaka and Odegaard mm. but with Zinchenko it's 4v2 in there and they just couldn't mm. live with it particularly in the first half I, I just think he's fascinating Sam Dean actually wrote a brilliant piece in the Telegraph about what he's brought off the pitch as well I mean you know the fist pump when he was taken off the pitch yesterday to the fans and how fired up he is like he is a winner that guy I'm convinced he's a winner and he, he came into Arsenal and has completely shifted the mentality. Like, even if you interview him or speak to him after a game, he doesn't want to talk about top four because he's been at Man City for years and that's not what you talk about. You mm. talk about winning things. He goes to any stadium and plays the same way with complete confidence. Yeah. I don't know. I'm I'm a massive, massive fan. And um, since he's come back into the team, really, since the winter break... You just see how much he adds, I think. Yeah, he's sort of like a... I don't know how best to describe him. You know, I used the word unique a bit earlier on. He's but... kind of a cheat code, I think. Yeah. Like, it, yeah. It, mm. no, but not, not many other teams can do it because they haven't got him. And, yeah, a, a, very, a very special player, very unique. Mm. Someone who just understands the game can you hang on one sec there's the doorbell hang on one sec oh right yeah one sec the doorbell music Well, I'll stop talking about Alexander Zinchenko. Yeah. Okay. Let's get on. Reluct- I'll reluctantly. Okay. All right. Uh, but we love him. I think that's what we're saying. Yeah. Um, let me ask a question here uh, from the Discord. It is from Spomfret. And he said, How pleased are you that we got away with some of our key players on four yellows? getting away with it. And I know you, you mentioned this to me in the, you know, when we were talking before the game, when you were uh, describing your bad feeling uh, to me. The bad feelings keep bad on feeling. coming. They're welcome to keep on coming. Please, please, please. Uh, but you did mention, you know, the idea that we could go into the United game without, you know, one or two of our, so one or two of our main men. Yeah. 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 Um, so we've come through that. So that was good. Yes, we have come through. And actually, so does it re- It resets after United? Is that right? Is that right? Is it 18 or 19 games? I don't It must be 19 because that would be halfway, you would think. Mm. Um, I think they said that a couple of... T- yeah. So it would be after the United game. 
So I don't know what happens if they get booked against United, I have to be honest. Well, don't that would know. be the 18th game. Oh, so no, it would be the 19th game. So it would be oh, yeah. after night, but it would be after 19 games. Uh, so I think they would probably still be banned for the one after that. But obviously, mm. having Newcastle, um, Spurs, and United back to back was a huge run of games. Mm. And yeah, to survive without those suspensions kicking in. I think the players deserve some credit, to be honest. To get, you know, Spurs picked up a load of bookings yesterday. And I think a North London derby, if you come out there, you know, without a booking, but winning the game, you've done mm. very, very well indeed. Um, so that is a big boost. And it's a massive game next weekend. Don't get me wrong, it's huge. As much as we're enjoying this one, that's... I think it'll be the Arsenal-United game with the best two teams uh, on show in that fixture for quite a long time. Mm. Uh, they both look like they've really turned a corner. Arsenal a bit further along than United, but they're in terrific form. Um, very, very, very generous uh, decision for United, though, in, in the derby. Like, yeah, that this, was that, fair. That, I mean, I mean it's, it's, it's absurd that that's not given offside. Um, but, I mean, that's what I was talking about in the first half of the show, where one moment just completely changes the complexion of a game because I think it was a fairly drab affair, wasn't it, the the City-United game? City go ahead, Jack Grealish, and you're thinking, well, they're going to go on and you know they'll hold on to this. United didn't look like they were going to threaten too much. All of a sudden, they get that ridiculous goal, and then they score another one pretty quickly afterwards, and you know the, the game has flipped on its head, so... The, I guess that's football, but I mean, that was a very, very fucking... I'd be so angry if that goal mm. was scored against us. Oh, me too. Uh, uh, and it's So, a funny so week. angry. So, it, so, so angry. <laughs> it's a funny week this week because City and United mm. play in midweek. So by the time we kick off on Sunday, there's a good chance the gap will be Smaller, you know. Um, now, I think, obviously, that suits us, really, because we get a week to prepare for United, whereas they go to Palace on Wednesday uh, Wednesday night. Come on, um, Come on, does, Patrick Vieira. Yeah, I don't quite know why our game, I think it's against Everton, uh, isn't mm, happening. But, I don't know either, yeah. Um, and it may, you know, you could argue it might be squeezed in and more congested period towards the end of the season with Europe and stuff. Mm. But anyway, listen, I think the United game is big and I'm glad we've got seven days to prep for it. Um, and hopefully some of those teams do us a, a favour, although I'm not expecting great things from Palace and Tottenham. Who no, face they, City, respectively. Yeah. Palace are struggling a bit at the moment, aren't they? They are, yeah. It's gone off, uh, off the rails a little bit for, for Vieira. Mm. Um, and obviously Tottenham are Tottenham. Um, oh, I mean, they are, they are shit. They are also they're shit, yeah. yeah. Um, interesting question. I liked this one from Tobias Halskov on Twitter. He said, hi, guys. During our test tenure, there have been some real decisive and turning pointish games. If you could pick three games that have been Oof. the most decisive slash turning point-ish, which games would you pick? That is a brilliant question that requires memory. Um, I would uh, say, I would say, the Chelsea game at the end of twenty twenty. Yeah, I would agree with that. Where we'd been on that bad run, he brought in Smith Rowe, and um. Yeah, we, we put an end to that and then obviously got, got better and improved from there. And I think you can you could really make that the the marker in terms of, you know, how this team has progressed and developed ever since. Because mm -hmm. there, there are a lot of stats, weren't there, about that, like in the second half of the season, Arsenal were the best or, you know, over the calendar year, Arsenal were, you know... Yeah in touching distance of City and Liverpool in terms of points and, and all that. But everyone went, well, that's no good because you lost eight games in a row or whatever it was, which is completely fair. But I think if you're talking about a, a, a win, uh, what was it? What's the description of it? A win that... 
Uh, Statement pivotal win. Or, yeah. uh, what was the question? Hang on. Uh, uh, turning point ish. Turning games. point ish games. I think that's definitely one of them. Yeah. Um, uh, one for me actually mm-hmm. would have to be <laughs> not a classic, but just that one nil win against Norwich um, after the first three games of last season. Yes. Where Arteta heavily changed the team. Brought in Tommy Asu, brought in Ramsdale, and crucially, set the team on a winning run again. Uh, okay. At a point where, had he not, I don't quite know how things would have gone. Yeah. For him. And let me think of another one that I would go for. I mean, it's not the most important game, but I can remember after we won away at Leicester last season, thinking that something was happening. Yeah, the one with the the Ramsdale save from was it the Vardy free kick or not Vardy free kick? It was uh, Madison. probably Madison. Um, I remember thinking after that game something is happening here, and it's you know it was still a bit inconsistent, but you could see the the roots of what we have now, um, you know, starting to poke through the scorched earth. <laughs> and and I would I I mean just to add one more from me, I would actually point to the first game of this season away at Crystal Palace. I just think going there where we'd had such a difficult time in the spring and Mm. winning just set us on course for this season. Especially after the Palace game last season where we we lost, you know, away from home and it was, um, was that was so damaging, you know? So, yeah, I mean, there's some of the big ones. I mean, there Mm. are plenty. I mean, obviously the... um, Two Man City games in the league coming up will obviously be added to that uh, yeah. list. Um, but yeah, there have been some, been some, some good significant ones. milestones along the way. All right, let's do a couple of quick ones. Um, Stuart on Twitter, is that Stuart underscore N1, says, Saliba takes most of the praise, but is it time to acknowledge that Gabriel is possibly the best centre-half in the league at the minute? He bullied Harry Kane twice this season and has been consistently good for a long time now. Yeah, he has been really good. Mm. and Super consistent. Super consistent, covers a lot of ground as well with Sinchenko vacating that space. Um, Arteta always picks him, you know? Is it 53 consecutive games in the Premier League now? Wow. Is that what they yeah, say? Yeah, he's into sort of Granite Shaka territory of always being yeah. picked, uh, despite having some, facing some criticism, some detractors, albeit not on the, on the scale that Shaka did. Um and I think that tells its own story. I think the physicality, this is not to downplay his, you know, his defensive intelligence or ability on the ball, which has improved dramatically in his time at Arsenal. But the physicality that he brings is a really useful weapon. Something I was struck by yesterday, you know, that triangle at the back, Saliba, Gabriel Parte, the way in which they dealt with Kane, mm. you know, they are really, really... Uh, physical players and it, it just gives us such a strong spine yeah so yeah he does deserve that um, um bah, bah, bah. oh <laughs> i wondered about this one uh hang on let me find it it was about the end of the first half was it on the end? penalty oh damn i can't find it somebody asked us what we were thinking oh yeah fletch fletch tweets tell us b- what you both were thinking at the end of the first half when the ref seemed to have pointed to the spot It'd be interesting to get both views as one was watching it on tv and one of the ground well i i was in sort of disbelief because i couldn't understand why there would have been a penalty um, no, could I, but, there was, but then suddenly there was a player rolling around on the floor and certainly a lot of the Spurs fans around me seemed to think a penalty had been awarded. Mm. Um, well, they were saying that on the TV as well. It was like, ooh, a penalty. They? Yeah. I was like, what? I mean, there was a part of me that just went, of course. Yeah, yeah no, of I course. Like, well, this is their one. Okay. Yeah, this is it. Okay. Yeah, they, they get it. We know they always get it. I don't know why they've gotten it, but, you know, it's actually pathetic from Hoiberg. Yeah, it's a complete piece of cheating slash gamesmanship for which he he should have been booked. And if the referee isn't awarding a penalty, you should probably give him a yellow card for that. Absolutely shameless. Um, what about this outlandish fifty-five? 
Does Richard Key's reaction to the post-match events make this the sweetest victory so far this season? <laughs> yeah, we did a similar one on the Discord from uh, Nick Capara, a uh, Caprara, sorry, um, who said, uh, "Whose piss is boiling more today and in need of medical attention, Richarlison, Conte, or Richard Keyes?" On a serious note, should the club's legal people be looking at Keyes' constant defamation of Arteta and issuing a cease and desist? I mean, I think that probably gives him more. Um, attention that he's worth but you know the fact that he's blaming Mikel Arteta for a Tottenham fan coming onto the pitch or trying to get onto the pitch to kick Aaron Ramsdale tells you exactly what a weird fucking weird guy this is somebody asked me about him yesterday I replied to someone on Twitter and and basically said well a he's like football Farage but also he is essentially Piers Morgan and Mikel Arteta is his Meghan Markle yes that's perfect. I was going to say that he's sort of developing Matt Letizier conspiracy theory tendencies. Like his idea that Mikel Arteta is somehow responsible for the conduct of the Spurs fans is so devoid of reality. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the Meghan Markle thing is perfect. He's like a spurned lover. It's it's weird. It, it would it, be annoying if it wasn't so funny. I mean, it is funny to think that he is sitting there fuming with, you know, as he's getting his hands waxed, um, you know, going absolutely crazy. But I also think it's weird and slightly obsessive. And he should probably shut the fuck up or somebody should tell him to shut the fuck up. Yeah, because just talk to somebody. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Get a friend. <laughs> Get because a friend. I, I, it's, it's even like, even in the clip from yesterday, I think it's... Jason McAteer and Andy Gray in the studio with him. And you can sort of see that they, they don't really say anything. Do you know what I mean? Mm. They're not like, yes, Richard, quite right. They're just sort of like, hmm, okay. Yeah, it is. It's very fucking odd. It's very odd. Um, I think I had one more, but I can't remember or I can't find it. Um, fuck it. I think we've recorded for long enough and people probably want to listen to the podcast, don't they? Yeah, and they want to go back to sort of social media and, you know, look at happy, smiling faces of Arsenal players and press like and retweet. And Another like quality uh, little clip yesterday as well of an undercover Arsenal fan in the home end. Well done, that man. Oh, that, that was salute. good. That is a brave move. He had the kit on as well. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, under his jacket and everything else. Um, no yeah. props to that guy. That's a great. Like the guy coach. on the on the phone. Uh, the, was it the Chelsea game? Chelsea was it at Stamford game, Bridge? Yeah. yeah. But um, I think yeah, you you run a particular gauntlet to do that at at White Hart Lane. So well done to him. Um, I enjoyed that clip. I'll put it in the show notes as well. Um, right. It was, a, it was great. It was a great day. As they say. It was indeed a great day and we're in a great position and hopefully we can uh, we can kick on from here. Manchester United coming up at the weekend. Look, we'll have more stuff in midweek of cro uh, across the side and in, uh, on Patreon and everything else. Um, we will leave it there for now, though. Uh, to you guys here, thank you very much indeed. As always, for listening, for downloading, for sharing. If you feel like giving us a review in your favorite podcast app, please feel free to do that. Um, as ever, uh, your your reviews are very welcome. Thank you very much. And uh, fuck Spurs, fuck Richarlison, and we'll catch you on the next one. Bye-bye.